welcome to the Dawi Expert Series podcast. The episode you're about to watch is an interview with Dolly Yang. Dolly Yang is a PhD researcher in the field of medieval Chinese health exercises. She has written a translation of the text Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun, a foundational Chinese medicine Daoyin document which uses Taoist sources as well as Chinese medicine theory to categorize illnesses and appropriate medical treatments via physical exercise. It's a fascinating text, and my interview with Dolly, uh, I think, went very well. So I think that uh, anyone who is interested in the field of Taoism, Chinese medicine, and their intersection, as well as health exercises such as Daoyin and Qigong, will be fascinated by this interview. So uh, I look forward to being able to present it to you. And without any further ado, here is my interview with Dolly Yang. Hello, Dolly. Hi, Robert. Nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you, you for, too. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. I'm delighted. Thank you. So you're, you are a researcher in the field of, of Chinese medicine, and you research traditional exercise therapy um, from very early on in the in the Chinese medical canon. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your background and your research topic? Okay, so um, I was born and brought up in Taiwan. So I had um, the, uh, traditional classical Chinese education. And then I came to the UK and did my BA in religious studies. Then I did a master's in librarianship. So I became a librarian for many years. And then I met uh, Professor Dr. Professor Vivian Lowe at um, University College London and became her PhD student. And so um, my, in my PhD thesis is, is about using therapeutic exercises to cure specific diseases based on seventh century Chinese medical text. And this is the text that um, that I never come across before. I only knew about this text from uh, Vivian, my supervisor, who mentioned this text to me. That was in the earliest time when we were trying, still trying to work out what topic I should research into. And um, and when once she mentioned this text and talked told me about what the text is about, I just felt that a strange affinity towards this text. I I can't explain why. And um, so, yeah, from then on, I decided I want to dedicate to, to the study of this text and in particular, the therapeutic exercises within this text. And that became my, the, the main basis of my PhD. My understanding is that um, after writing your, your doctoral thesis, you've also um, compiled it into a book, which is available um, I, I remember it being available through Purple Cloud Press. Um, and can can you tell us the name of the document that you researched, as well as uh, the name of the of the book, in case anyone wants to get it? Sure. So this seventh century Chinese medical text is called Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun, Treatise on the Origins and Symptoms of Medical Disorders. And so in this text, you have a lot of materials on therapeutic exercises known as Daoing. And um, so, so that was kind of the, the, the main core uh, research materials for my PhD thesis, as well as my first book, which is just published by Purple Cloud Institute. And the title of the, the, the book is called Prescription, Exercise Prescription in Sui, China. That's between 581 and 618. Excellent. Now, this the the book that you're working with, Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun, is not an easy text. It's is a very uh, personally, I find it to be a very difficult text to read in Chinese. And so, I know, I mean, I'm not a native uh, reader, so of course, that's one strike against me. But it's still not an easy text. And one of the yeah. major questions that jumped out to me about it is that looking at the text, there's it's it's a prescriptive approach to 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 Dao Yin exercises. Just just for the sake of the audience, I want to mention that Dao Yin is is essentially in this context like um, a lot of stretching or postural exercises. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. and but the interesting thing about the text is that because it's a, a, a prescription based format, it has a lot of different illnesses in it. 
And I've never seen that in any other document. Can you describe a little bit about the, the structure and the format? Yeah, so I would, I would say this is the innovation of the Sui period in terms of the uh, medical um, text. So this text particular is, um, is what we call the nosological text. So it classif classifies diseases. So in this text, you will find 1,739 disease entries under about 71 categories. So you have two categories, uh, two sort of the bigger, um, the Bing uh, categories, which is the 71. And underneath the 71 categories, you then have different disease entries. And altogether, they are 1,739 entries. And then within those uh, disease entries, you will then find some entries would have the materials, the instructions of Darwin exercises, which then tell us if you then do these exercises, it will cure this specific diseases. So in a way, it kind of helped because the text was actually written um, by the imperial court physicians for physicians. So it's, it's, you know, it's like a textbook. And therefore, it's for, it's, it's for the physicians to be able to identify the patient's illness and, and then find the suitable dying exercises to treat that diseases. So this is, to me, is, is a, an innovation of this particular text, the way that the dying ex exercises are kept, you know, um, described in that text in a very systematic way under the disease categories really help to enhance the accessibility of physicians to be able to prescribe dialing exercises. And that will be the intention of that text. It seems like um, that, well, actually, before I ask this question, I'd like to ask one other one. In the text, are there any other prescriptive models? Like, are there herb prescriptions or or um, moxa or, or, or anything like that? Or is it only Dalian? Yeah, I think um, there's probably only one or two places that you will find it will say to use particular kind of herbal remedies but essentially it is it would it gives you mostly the yangsheng recipes which is relate to you know uh daily life you know uh, personal hygiene as well as dowing exercises so it's mainly focusing on the yangsheng recipes or the or the dowing methods those the the herbal remedies or the decoctions it was says they have been described elsewhere. So in this text, these are the exercises the, the, the Yang Shen Fang, the Dao Ying Fang, are going to be prescribed in this text. Right. And that's very interesting, too, because there's the, the element of it, which is lifestyle oriented. So Yang Sheng. And mm -hmm. when people um, read these texts, uh, I wonder what's the balance between um, more like prescriptive lifestyle methods or Taoian methods? Is, is one weighing more heavily than the other? So is I would say more as the uh, the Taoian methods. There, there are definitely Yangsheng elements in it, the Yangsheng Feng, um, but mostly are to do with the Taoian exercises, which again is pretty amazing because there are over 200 different Taoian exercises for different diseases. So it's, And is it way, true that there's... Fun. Oh, sorry about that. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's fine. Yeah. It just, it, I mean, we have a rich, rich materials of those dying exercises from the medieval period. And there's not really any book that's that's like it. There's a lot of Daoyan texts and there's a lot of medical texts, but I don't think there's so many other books throughout Chinese medicine history that mm. that are similar. And and do you, do you have any idea about why that might be? I think d during the Sui period is quite an interesting time. It's a time when China was unified. So there were a lot of, so there were two main emperors in the Sui, during the Sui period. Sui is quite short, it's only lasted about 38 years. So you have the, the, the two Sui emperors, they were very keen to, to bring everything together. So that it was time when lots and lots of things would come to the, to the imperial court, including different texts. So they would bring in lots and lots of things and compile those texts together, and then they would then be able to create new texts. So Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun is one, was one of those texts being compiled from the different sources that were then available in the Sui court. 
And so it was a time when there's just so many, so a lot of sort of standardization, you know, formalizations that happening and that happened in the medical reforms. Right. That's, that is really mm. fascinating because one of the things that um, I hear from time to time from, from friends who are well-versed in, in the history of these materials um the the sway was was very influential on the Tang, almost like the sway is like the big brother of the Tang period, where you see this great proliferation of medicine, but it seems like they kind of move away from the Daoyan direction. But yeah. I also wonder, um the that Zhu Bing Yuan Holun has had an outsized impact on modern Chinese medicine thought. So for instance, if I grab this textbook, which is randomly on my desk, okay. so this is okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> commonly used textbook for Chinese medicine, oh. Qigong. And and uh, I think that um, Zhu Bing Yuan Holun is probably mentioned about 15 or 20 times. <laughs> okay. because, because it's one of those things that, um, because there's such a, a, a lack of similar texts when people mm. go back to, mm -hmm. to dig through them, they end up either referring to Taoist texts or, yeah. or, or this one because of the lack of other similar Chinese mm -hmm. medicine texts. Mm. And I, I'm wondering because you do have a, a broad research base, if you can give us an idea about the how Daoyin transformed from what it, whatever it originally was in very mm -hmm. old times mm -hmm. through to the Sui period and beyond. Mm. Yeah, I think what you just described is absolutely right and is, um, is actually very pertinent. And that is when, when we get to the Sui, when everything is become trying to become centralized, you know, to, to in, almost like to in enhance the political power, then you have this, um, the text that is bringing in the Daoing materials, which could be scattered among, you know, different groups, religious groups, Daoists, Buddhists, whatever, um, but then br brought them into the, this kind of medical text. So in a way, they medic medicalize those exercises and then put them into a medical you know, so then we we then said that's a medical, you know, we, we use those down exercises for medical purposes. So yeah, so this text in a sense is quite unusual or quite special, is they 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 bring they brought all these down exercises and then put them under these different diseases. And therefore we then can say, yes, do these exercises that they, because they are specifically for treating diseases. So they are curative rather than just preventative. So that's very, very different from what we call the Yang Shen text, where we see a lot of Daoing exercises, but they tend to be preventative because then they say, oh, you do all these exercises, you're going to live for, for, for a long time. Yeah. So, but it's different. Um, but this is like, yes, we're going to use this for treatment method. This is going to be part of the state medicine. So it's very authoritative and we're going to train all our doctors to be able to prescribe these exercises to our patients. So in a sense, is a, a great sort of medical reform, which was a vision that I would say coming out of the Second Sui Emperor, who did, who was so determined to elevate Daoing as part of the core uh, state medicine during his reign. So then, then if you look back to the earliest period, so when we talk about the you know the Daoing in the Han period. What we found, what we found is, you know, the tombs, the Han tomb where we discovered the um, the Daoing charts, where we got the uh, people, you know, different figures doing different exercises. So we call that Daoing chart. Also, we found in another Han tomb, uh, there's a, a text which is which is called uh, Yin Shu, the Book of Pulling, and the word Yin Shu was actually written at the at the back of the first bamboo slip. So we we know that text is called Yin Shu. The book of pulling in that text it it shows many many exercises but then we know that these texts were written for the hand nobilities yeah so they are the people who have the time and the um resources to 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 engage those kind of practices and they became the kind of so that the patrons of the so-called feng shi people who who you know who have these kind of knowledge specialist knowledge and to be able to pass on these these knowledge and practices what which is the what which what we call the xian practice yeah the 
the, the transcendence or the immortality practices to these uh, Han nobles. And um, so those are the people then would then pass their, their, the knowledge further down the line. So doing the, um, the sort of the, the, the time between the end of the Han and the Sui, we have the 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 Liu Chao, yeah, the waiting Nanbei Chao, or the the period of um um this disunion, or um yeah, anyway, there are different names for that period. So let's say waiting Nanbei Chao. Then you have um the the well-to-do families. They they would be the 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 keepers of Chinese uh lots of the cultural knowledge and including the medical knowledge. So they would then pass on these kind of information and knowledge. So at that time, it would be more to do with the the family. So the the, the family family trans, uh, transmission of medical knowledge. Then when you get to the Sui and Tang period, then you have more as the um, the, the 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 education by the official by the um, the imperial courts. So it's a it's a different different uh, way of transmitting knowledge which took place during the Sui and Tang period and then therefore you got the the book like Sui, uh, which was used as a textbook this is this is very very yeah. rich commentary I'm so delighted um because it, it I have so many questions about this personally um okay. so to go back to the let's say shortly after the Han Dynasty I, I'm really interested actually in that period also from what you mentioned, the Mawang Dui funerary complex yeah. mm -hmm. or other similar areas. But first I'd like to ask, you mentioned, I think this is so important for people who want to understand um, actually how Taoism came about, but also how Chinese medicine and Taoism eventually became compartmentalized and separate. Um, but what you mentioned that I thought was really important is that there were these families and, you know, I've thought mm -hmm. about this before, like you have, like the the Sama family and you have the Wei family and these different, yeah. you know, people who a lot of people would recognize them as early Taoist personages. But the way that you mentioned it, I think it, it is an even better way to understand it. They're like carriers of elite carriers of culture during a period that was not well unified into a coherent government system. And yeah. then only after that it becomes codified. So can you can you further expand a little bit? Because it seems like many of those families simultaneously carried Chinese medicine knowledge, Taoist knowledge, and and other or proto Taoist knowledge, and other, you know, similar things. How how did that work, and how did it proliferate? Yeah, so I would say a lot of these sort of well, we call them menfa or shizu. So these are well-to-do aristocratic families. They they um they want they. Basically, there was a time when you know China was. I mean, that period after the the, the fall of the Han, everything became very fragmented politically, and uh, there were also time when um, family, a large lots of people migrated from the north to the south, and uh, so then they really had to learn to look after themselves. So these families, they they really wanted to be able to um, have those knowledge. So apart from the Confucian traditional knowledge they also learned from you know from the the, the Taoist particularly you know at that time the Tian Shi Dao a lot of those large those uh, well-to-do families were followers of Tian Shi Dao or the later the Shangqing Pai as well and uh, so you find these people they you know they have the traditional Confucian um, upbringing or cult um knowledge but then they also learn about different things could be from the Taoist could also be from the Buddhist and um, so yeah so at that time you know basically people just they it, the knowledge transmission can be very fluid it doesn't matter who you are really and um, and yeah so so that's that's what what we see what happened in the Taoist traditions you know that is part of Chinese medicine but it's also being used in the Taoist tradition, you know, as well. So, so yeah, so it's basically everywhere. Yeah, well, and one of the things, uh, the reason why I personally think this is important is because many times 
um, modern people, but especially especially in the Anglosphere. I don't know about different parts of the Occidental world, but especially in the Anglosphere, yeah. Yeah. we have a habit of um, putting uh, people or practices into very specific particular categories. Mm -hmm. You know, if you said go home, oh, I would immediately think Taoist, but maybe okay. you know it's not so simple, right? And I th I think what you mentioned about the fluidity is a very important idea, uh, even even today, right? People, mm -hmm. it, you're from Taiwan. And I remember the last yeah. time that I was in Taiwan, most of the local temples, although they're ostensibly Confucian temples, they have um, Taoist deities, they have Buddhas, and people, they have very diverse yeah. ideas. And I'm wondering, is that something that, because it seems there's always a tension between the organized state culture and the individuated, you know, uh, local level culture. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that from the perspective of that period that led toward the development of something like Zhu Yuan Holun, which is very organized, but comes from diverse sources. Yeah, so I think it's, I think it's, it's, to me, it's better to think about these terms quite loosely defined. So if you say to me that Ge Hong is a Taoist, I, I kind of agree with you, but then I can also disagree with you. It depends how I feel that day, I think. Um, and that's the reason, that's because it depends how how you want to define what Tao is, is really, and then it can be anything. And therefore, if somebody said, well, you know, that is just like a shortcut to kind of describe somebody's activity, then fair enough. And um, so so it's just how how we understand the term, which is can be very different, you know, and that that is that could be the problem. But then also, um, you know, things change over time. So for example, if we think about dying, uh, one dying exercise, which is clacking teeth. Okay, so we found this particular exercise in Yin Shu, in a Han tomb. And in that text, it tells you, okay, you clack your teeth, it's going to help you with your toothache. You say you won't have toothache. Well, that's very logical, isn't it? So clacking your teeth, so that's good. But then when that exercise came into a Taoist text, they were using the clacking teeth not to cure a uh, toothache, but to invite uh, God, uh, you know, the gods to, to enter into the body or to wake up the gods inside the body. And so that's a very different way of using the clacking teeth. And then to, when you get to the Zhubin Yuan Hou Lun, it brings those two elements. So you find one place where they clack, you clack your teeth and say, oh yeah, that will cure the toothache. The other one says, yes, crack your teeth. It will help you to fight. So then the, the evil ghost will not enter to your body. You, you will, it, will be protect, it will protect you if, if you crack your teeth. That certainly comes from a Taoist tradition. So, so then you then see these kind of then being appropriated by the Sui government to say, no, these are all now Chinese medicine. <laughs> this is all part of Chinese medicine now. So, right. so it's interesting because then in this text, in Zhubi and Hou Lun, you will have, you know, people chanting, uh, reciting the, um, because incantation is part of the Daoing exercise in this text, in this 7th century Chinese medical text. So then you you will incant uh, the, the, West, the queen mother of the West or some Taoist deity, which for them is not a problem, you know. So, so, so that anybody can practice this. You don't have to be a Taoist, you just want to cure your disease. And that's, I think, also interesting because when we look at modern iterations of Chinese medicine, and I don't want to be too specific about what kind of Chinese medicine, but in modern iterations of Chinese medicine theory, they have these ideas also about, um, you know, exterior pathogen or seeing ghosts and, and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But they're, in modern times, they're viewed as, as metaphorical. And I wonder to what, at least within, you know, the Chinese medicine field of current practitioners. Um, yeah. And I wonder to what extent in past times, because you mentioned incantations, oh. there's there's really only a very small amount of Chinese medicine texts historically that have incantations. And so I wonder if this was something, and again, you know, maybe this is a one of those, um, I would say like a, a pretty typical mental block that comes up for, for for Anglo people that read these texts, whether we should take that as a, a literalistic thing where there's an element of faith involved that's either religious or pseudo-religious, 
or whether they also viewed that as a, as a metaphor within the context of Chinese medicine at that time. Well, I would say in medieval China, the idea of medicine is very different from how we understand medicine. So in the Sui period, for example, you see the three specialized departments of, within the imperial medical of um, the imperial medical of medicine, the three departments, first one is medicine, so drugs or acupuncture, then the second one is anmo, which they teach uh, darling exercises. The third one is zhou jing, so zhou jing is uh, um, uh, incantation and interdiction, and this specifically about Buddhist and Taoist rituals. So basically, we, we know then in the Sui period, the, the Sui government, they, they appropriated all these religious rituals and bring them over, brought them to the, to the framework of the state medicine. For them, that's really, that's really not a problem. They really see that as part of the medical treatments. And I would say even to the later time, these kind of, these kind of um, medical treatments were still quite prevalent. I would say, you know, the, 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 what we call the TCM, the traditional Chinese medicine, which we now know or familiar with, obviously trying to get rid of those things are actually quite a recent thing. A lot of the sort of what you call pre-modern Chinese medical texts, they would have a lot of these kind of what we now think superstitious or whatever, you know, type of treatment methods. But I think in medieval time and in earlier time, that's definitely through and through medicine. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think if you look at some other texts which are maybe contemporaneous approximately with 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 that text, um, like Sun Sun Miao, as an example, has an uh, entire Yangsheng section that takes up about half of, of one of his major treatises. Um, and it, it, it deals with um, many things which are, you know, at the very least... Um, not very, maybe very strong incantations, but at least visualization in these kind of topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder in, so one of the things that, that we hear about, and I always want to hear, um, you know, Chinese voices about this, because it's something that gets talked about a lot, again, by non-Chinese people in the Anglosphere. But people say, oh, you know, these um, medicine and Taoism and everything springs from some sort of, some sort of Sino-Tibetan shamanism. And I, I'm not okay. sure how I feel about that topic, but I, I would love to hear, since we've talked a little bit about incantations in medicine, what how you feel about that, having having a background, um, you know, uh, Chinese Taiwanese background, how you feel when people mention this idea of shamanism as like a root of these practices? Um, well, I would say Catherine Disper might agree with you or with, with them, and uh, because she would say the the roots of Daoing came from the shamanic traditions. So she identified those uh, sort of four myth mythological figures. So they are like Peng Zhu, Sun, uh, Wang Ziqiao, Ci Shong Zi, uh, these kind of people. Yeah. So they they were under during the Han period. They were described as Xian, but these people they were living in sort of Huangdi periods. You know. So they were. They were like um, the rain masters of um, of the yellow emperor or whoever, and so they were the the sh shamans, if you like. So um, so these people, yes, they were the sh the Xian people when when they were described under the under the hands of the 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 Han writers, they called them yeah they called them Xian. So they were Wu and then became Xian, yeah, and so. Then, then, then later you have the, I would say the incantation and because the Taoists, they borrow quite a lot of those Xian materials, which you could say they were the originally from the Wu practice. Yeah. So then there were some kind of elements of that fed into the Taoist practice and then also into the Taoing exercises. So they were, they were some kind of connections. But then um, if you then tell me that uh, that everything came from the, the shamanic tradition, I would say that might be just a little bit too simplistic because a lot of time they're actually trying to reject or trying to differentiate themselves from those spirit mediums. They, they want to say, no, we are the Taoist or you know, we are 
we are proper physicians. You know, we use qi, uh, yin and yang and fire elements. We use different, you know, different ways to treat our patients, ways to look at the diseases, not just like you guys thinking about just, oh, you know, this is um, because of ancestral uh, crimes or whatever, you know, um, so so it's a different way of looking at the causes of diseases and therefore different treatment methods. So they actually deliberately trying to distinguish themselves, you know, those uh, feng shi people, or the, the later Taoist people from those Wu practitioners. So then you, so, so they, they then have their own way of, you know, using a different methods or different exercises for different purposes. Yeah, I think it. I think that that also there is a a topic that um, is is also worthy of discussion, which is that there is a very lively multi general or multi generational discussion going on about how should things be defined, and people um, wash back and forth between positions. So my, for instance, my area of interest is is Nadan internal alchemy. And okay. when you read early Nadan books, um, like like Wu Jianpian, Understanding Reality, there's really a hard stop where where the authors of some of those texts up to about the Yuan Dynasty they really reject earlier iterations, even of even of like Fang Shu, even of the the the, the Fang Fang Shu arts, and they go yeah. in the direction of saying we just shouldn't do any of that. And then later you see this reabsorption of those ideas after Kunyang, you know, bringing them back into Taoism from from other sources. And and I yeah. wonder if you can mention that because I think maybe I have a kind of unreasonable position as a as a modernist, which is to say, well, people were moving away from certain kind of ideas toward a more rationalistic view. But of course, that's a very modern perspective. And I wonder if you can can tell me what you think about this washing back and forth between positions which may be seen as more mystical. And then ones which may be seen as more rational within within Chinese medicine. Well, I would say that's also what the the Sui government was trying to do with this Zhuge Yuan Ho Lun text. You know, they they selected the different type of Taoing exercises, obviously exclude certain ones. So they were saying, well, these are the ones which we recognize and we approved, and there are other ones which maybe were practiced by all these charlatans, and we don't want these people. Yeah. And so then, so it's already being filtered and there's already trying to legitimize certain, certain groups, uh, privilege certain groups and, uh, you know, and sort of disadvantage other groups through these kind of um, treatments of including or excluding certain practices. So, so it's kind of already, you know, sort of a little bit what you're saying, you know, they, everyone has got its own agenda and, um, so, and at different periods, you got different different people saying different things, and so so yeah, I think just just bear in mind that everything is kind of all contextual based. You got to really know what which period you're talking about, in what kind of circumstance you're talking about. So yeah. Now, just going rounding back to incantation within Zhu Bei and Holun for a minute. Um, okay. So when we look at many Taoist texts, a lot of the incantations are associated with writing talismans. But is it in, in that text when they're doing incantations, are they relative to Taoian exercises or how do they bring the incantation into the medical practice? Oh yeah, so so they so, so they would incorporate Taoian exercise with incantations. And um and again, is I would say they borrow these exercises from the Yang Shen text. So the Yang Shen Fang Dao Yin Fa, yeah. So the, these exercises were not invented by the the Sui medical officials in, at, at the Sui court. They were already there. Right. You know, it's, so they they just need to copy and paste onto the text that they they are working on. And um, but then these texts, then they were really written for I would say aristocrats people. So then they so they were imagine in a in a sort of the little child periods these well-to-do families they wanted to be able to keep themselves fit and healthy so they do certain kind of practices so they do incantation they do um you know make sure that they are very um healthy um so there's one that is after you done the done the um 
incantation, you then comb your hair lots, lots of times, keep combing your hair. So imagine the chi, you know, the flow of the chi, sort of like, you know, and stimulation of your, the, the, your brain. And so then it also says that then um, if, you, if, you, if you're tired, you can let your servant to comb your hair. So then you know that text is definitely specifically for writing for, you know, these kind of aristocrats uh, members. And, uh, but then that, that exercise were absorbed into to be a whole learn. They did not take that away. They still kept that, that description in there. And because it's, it's a quotation, so they just kept it there. So then you see that, um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, you know, how how those practices being borrowed and, you know, move in and out of different different social spheres, if you like. Yeah, I think a, a comparable text in the Taoist world would be Yunji Qiqian from, from the Song Dynasty, where a lot of these older documents from the Han or even some pre-Han period texts are kind of put together. Yeah. So rather than yeah. being... But but one of the things though is I think that Zhu Bing Yuan Holun does a better job of having a, co a coherent thesis. Like I feel like some of the other similar books like Yunji Qiqian or Dao Shu, mm. they don't have such a coherent. It just here's a bunch of practices. But That's Zhu right. Bing Yuan Holun has it sort of almost has its own theory, but through structure. Yes. And and I wonder. Um, so I know that I've looked at, at your your blog, which by the way is excellent, and we'll make sure to link it in the. At your website in 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 our um you know YouTube description, but I I wanted to mention that you have um done a good job of presenting some of the exercises there, uh in a way that people could understand and do them themselves. And I wonder when you when you look at the um exercises through the lens of of prescription, one of the things about Chinese medicine is at any time in history is that they have these kind of concepts of um. Like, uh, you know, heat, cold, vacuity, etc. And I'm wondering, can people do these practice? Can anybody do these practices at any time, or do they have to have some sort of understanding of their, um, you know, diagnosis relative to Chinese medicine? Um, I would say they just um, because we're all modern people, yeah. <laughs> so we can't get away not to have our so the modern bias, if you like. So if people will approach those exercises, just go ahead, just do it. And because we all come from, we, we, we don't engage those exercises as a piece of blank paper. We don't, you know, we all have, we all come from somewhere. And so, so me being a Chinese person, born and brought out in Taiwan, read Chinese texts, may have some advantage but may not, you know, in engaging these kind of exercises. It all depends. So you might have a diff different insights, which I don't have. And so, so therefore, I think that's what's the exciting things about, about this book that I just, uh, I have written and published by the Purple Cloud Institute. The whole idea is to really bring out these material of medieval Dali exercises that nobody know, see, nobody seems to know anything about. And also have have them some of them illustrated to sort of entice people to say, oh, look at these pretty pictures, yeah. And so, oh, what what are they doing there? And so it's to try to really engage people to say, well, have a go, you know, practice those and see how you feel, because we wouldn't know until we actually physically do it. And even when we physically do it, everybody would have a different different feeling about it or different understanding about it. And you know, even in yourself, if you practice it now or later or after you've done it for two years, all the feeling you have a different understanding again. And but then that all that is all good because when we if we as long as we start engaging with these exercises, then we will then gain more insights from what is this all about. Because at the moment, what we have is this seventh century medical text. It tells us these exercises, which has been carefully, systemat systematically placed under different disease descriptions. So it's almost like telling you in a very author authoritative way, because it's a state-sponsored medical text written by imperial medical officials, yeah? So these are all like experts. Okay, so they are telling us, okay, do these exercises, it cure uh, lumbar pains, these uh, headache, 
this one is going to you know help with your indigestion so do these exercises it that's that's what we're going to that's what we're teaching our uh, physicians and going to ask them to prescribe these exercise to 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 the patients so we want to know really is that is that really effective i mean without word to our modern people uh, you know so we want to know and the only way for us to know is we engage with the, the text with the the exercise and find out with my own limited exercise of those um materials i think i think they are incredible i really i really do and the reason why is because we know we know about tai chi we know about these sort of different qigong practices and they came from these materials but because they've been so um in a way very um confined into those particular modalities so that those are all we know and but then if you look at the the materials in Jubilee and Hall and you realize there's vast loads loads of exercise that I've never heard of I don't even know how that how, how you do that position or whatever so so yeah we need to find out we need to know well, how do you do them and and, yes. and they will be so exciting it's like expand expanding your the, the the portfolio of all these different exercise not just restricted to different styles of Taiji or different styles of Qigong. And I think this is a, a great segue because one thing that I had wanted to mention is that um, what one of the things that your work is doing, whether it's intentional or not intentional, is it's kind of um, deconstructing Qigong in a sense. Um, because one of the things, like for me, as as I, I'm, I'm, also, my background is also in history. I, I have a much more humble background in history than you do. I only have a, a, a bachelor's degree, but nonetheless, um, one of the things from a from a historical perspective that uh, absolutely drives me up the wall is that um, when I look at qigong, by, by the way, I practice qigong too. So, um, but too. I look at it and I see the assumptions of qigong in in China, but also in in the West. And one of the things that really makes me crazy is that people get very very attached to ideas like you know small heavenly orbit or you know three dantian or or any of those kind of things which have which are all borrowed from different places it, or 12 meridians right all all borrowed from chinese medicine taoism buddhism etc and people just take it as though it's the final word and it's the truth but it's only just a very short period of time that we've understood these things according to those principles. And before that, like especially in Jubing Yuan Holun, I don't do they even mention meridians at all? I don't think so, right? Or only very scantly. I don't think they do, no. And and so I this is one thing that I they, think sorry, really, sorry, that, that's yeah. not quite right, actually. I mean, they do mention points. Yeah. Certain, you know, like the Yong Quan or the yeah. Yuan. Or you know different different points in the body, the so, oh yeah 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 so they do they do talk about different um sorry, they do talk about the meridians yeah yeah but there's the a channels. very particular view now you know that she has to go up the do and down the mm -hmm. ran and it has to spend yeah. a while between in the ming tang etc. Yeah. I mean, okay well yeah um so so they do have that though <laughs> oh really <laughs> they do have that to be honest yes they do because oh, they have um, visualization which mm. you breathe in and bring your attention to the to the dantian they do use mm. the word uh, sorry they do use the word ni wan oh so ni wan okay. is kind of the Taoist term you see they borrow yeah. Dao, Daoist Mud term ball, yeah. yeah so they they say uh breathing into the ni wan and then mm. breathe so in so visualize the the chi going down 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 to the yong quan and then the chi oh, goes okay. out Right. So then that is, and that's a quite an important practice um, in, in this text. It, it appears in several different places. So you know that they do use visualization very, you know, a lot in in the treatments. So, so yeah, they do. Yeah, <laughs> I guess they do. Mm -hmm. But there's, yeah. there, what, what I was trying to get at is that there's this very um, authoritative okay. um, air in modern Qigong where people, and and in my opinion, a lot of the practices are approximately put together actually in a similar way, if, if you think about it. The 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 genesis of modern Qigong starts around what, like 1954 or something. Um, the Ogui Zhen. Yes. With the Ogui Zhen, exactly. Yeah. 
and and you can see that it was a it was a project. It was a government project, actually, not yeah. so similar to to Jubing Yuanholun. But they brought a lot of people from you know Buddhist background or Taoist. Like for instance, Chen Yingning was was involved in 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 the establishment, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And yeah. and in a sense, it kind of has a similar flavor. But yeah. I think that we, if we look at it as being um, implacable or totally authoritative or describing something which is absolutely true under all conditions without looking at the historical genre and mm -hmm. seeing that the, the the diversity in it mm -hmm. um that it's kind of a trap and so one of the things that i mm -hmm. i was delighted about seeing seeing your work is that because you can show us something that as you said there's practices there that maybe we can't even figure out all of them there you know some as i mentioned before it's a very difficult book and so it was it was very delightful to see that um these kind of things you would never see in a modern qigong context um and right. so I, yeah so i'm wondering if you can if you can comment on that too i don't know how familiar you are with with the more recent genre but if you can comment on your perception of the differences yeah well i would say well now we know that they were Daoing exercises before, you know, before 1950s, before Liu Guizhen, and even Liu Guizhen say Qigong has got 3,000 years uh, history. Again, you know, we can debate that because they're basically using the word Qigong as a short, as a, like a, a, a shortcut, if you like, or the, the words to depict these kind of um, tradition of therapeutic exercises. Obviously, in the old days, you don't use the word qigong because that did not we did not know that word until 1950. Yeah, I mean, the first time we saw the term qigong, um, briefly mentioned maybe in the Tang text, but then they were not really uh, de describe it as some kind of practice. It was just almost like in passing that they were saying, you know, the work of qi has now accomplished or something like that. And but then in in the Qing, there's a Qing text, a Qing Taoist text, which definitely said. The work of this particular practice of qigong is not is is like this. So we know it is a practice. We know it's a type of uh, exercise. So and then I think then Liu Guizhen refashioned that term qigong and then turned that into you know the, this kind of personal qi practices. So so then if we then trace it back, then we realize a lot of these qigong practices that kind of invented or reinvented post 1950s they obviously had the the connections with the Taoing exercises but then is you know they they add a lot of their own flavors their own whatever you know and um which is fine which is absolutely no problem but you know but just to 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 remember that there's a rich tradition right you know behind all this and uh, and if you are if if you are curious to know well, what's all these materials what what are they saying? You know, what are they saying in, in the fourth century Yangsheng Yaoji, which is actually lost, but then you can actually find the material in the later text in Yang Xin Yan Ming Lu Lu, which is a Tang text, then you find the material there. So so and they, they also give you some dying exercises in that text. So what are they, you know? And um, and so, so if you're curious, then you will go back and look look for those uh, primary sources. And I would say the more you can engage with primary sources. The better because it gives you this kind of rich understanding of this Taoing traditions, which is which are quite varied because it's for different people, for different purposes. Jubin and Holland again is a very specific text, it's a medical text, it's a it's trying to build this unified China, bringing everything together. We want to standardize and centralize everything. You know, is that part of that project? Yeah, well, and and so um that I think that another another interesting area or question relative to this, because you mentioned that you know after the appearance of Liu Guizhen and and, the, and that that group that um, their posture was this is a continuation of of something that's already existed and and I think that if you look at Chinese culture um, in general, Yangsheng is very ubiquitous. Like you can walk down the street in any Chinese city, and you can see people doing uh, all kinds of different exercises. Yeah. Or if you're okay. if you're an early riser, you can go to the park and you have the the men standing, uh, you know, shouting on top of the mountain, which I think is Chinese opera practice, but it feels good oh. for them. Um, <laughs> but that's very ubiquitous in China. And one of the things 
I always thought a very unfair criticism that was levied, especially by by Western scholars against Qigong in particular, was this idea that there was a discontinuity from the history. But as as you say, clearly there's this whole, they have a modern take, but I think in every generation, the understanding has has changed, hasn't it? Like Jubing Yuan Holo and is different from what came before it and what came after it okay. is also quite different. So, I mean, in my mind, I have a pretty clear conception just it's just for me personally but i have a pretty clear conception of of the general pathway that these things took but i wonder you know and and we did touch on it a bit but i wonder when you look at the historical trajectory of Yin or other types of you know therapeutic or energetic practices um coming from early times to present day do you think that it's this is i know it's not a great question but do you think it's kind of there is a sense of an unbroken thread, or do you think that there there's a different model that explains how we how we got to where we're at today? I think it depends how you look at it. You can say there are there's a continuous pathway, but then you can also say that there are some disruptions along the along the lines. And um, so it's kind of depending on how you say it and how you see it how you interpret, you know, those kind of changes and developing, you know, developments, the continuity and the, um, the changes within the, the, the development of Daoing. And um, so, so yeah, you can find certain um, similarities. So for example, if you, if you, if you do the, the April Cates, the modern Qigong, some of those exercises, they are, you can find them in Zhubin and Ho Lun. So there's, there's one like going one going up, the other one going down, and then like that. So then, yeah, that's already appeared in Zhubin and Ho Lun. So you know, oh, there's a connections there, you know. But then Zhubin and Ho Lun will tell you, okay, you do this, that will cure what disease, yeah? Certain disease is very specific. And um, there, but there's, yeah, there are also differences because again, depending on who, who is using those exercises for what purposes? So, so yeah. I mean, you know, um, my answer to uh, my my answer to your question is is really depends on the individual how they see it as a innovation of a, a continu con continual tradition or or not. The only problem is they do tend to use term which did not is exist before. So then, if they say like qigong lasts for, it's like three thousand years history of qigong. Then you kind of have to say, well, that the term qigong, you, you know, you kind of have to redefine because it did not it did not appear then. You kind of have to use the word Daoing until you get to the Liu Guizhen period. Mm -hmm. So, so I think just be more sensitive to the terms that people use at that time. So, for example, in the Han period, if you're saying the Taoist in the in the Han during the Han were doing Daoing, I would say no, I don't agree with you because. At that time, the, the Taoists probably did not practice, you know, <laughs> because they 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 were more as a sort of like what we what we think of the the, the drums kind of people in the Han period. Yeah, they really detest. They they kind of like look down on these um, people who practicing these sort of bodily things. They think, well, these are inferior. We don't want to have anything to do with them. So then, so then you can't really say the Taoists were practicing down because. That there's a spe specific thing that they t totally reject. So yeah, Zhuangzi doesn't like Pangzu very much. No, exactly. No, <laughs> so they were two, completely at two two camps. Yeah. Yeah. So then, if you say Zhuangzi or their followers were the so-called Taoists, then you can't really say Pangzu were also Taoists. Well, well, okay, but they were the people who who definitely practiced Taoing. Yeah. Yeah. Not the Zhuangzi a lot. That's that's fascinating. There's it, this is this has been such a rich uh, talk that we've had. I think though that now we're coming close to an hour, so there's a few customary oh. questions that we ask as we as we wind down. Um, but I think that I need to insert an, another one first. Do you have um, do you have a, a practice community, or do you ever offer any kind of teachings on on these topics? Hmm, that's something which I would really love to do. I mean, I, I did a, a class locally, but that was just offering a simple Daoing, um, Qigong exercises, the eight brocades. And um, so it's, and I did show them a little bit of the exercise from, from Zhubin Yue Ho Lun. 
but to so yes i would really love to have like a group and actually uh your hand housen the publisher from the uh, P purple cloud institute they have uh, some kind of educational platform and they really would like me to be able to form like a group so we can then do some exercise together so i told him that i don't want to teach the exercises from Drew Holo. I want to just sort of facilitate. I said, well, these are my translation. Look at the text. And, you know, you tell me how, how you would do it. <laughs> or what I show you, maybe I'll show you what I think, what the exercise look like. And um, which I did, you know, with those illustrations. And you then tell me, oh, no, or maybe, you know, maybe there's something else or could be do it in, could, could it be, you know, done in a different way. So, yeah people then can get together and really look at the text, engage with the text and engage with the exercises. And we will then have a much better understanding of these medieval Taoist practices. And I think it will be so beneficial. We, we ne you never know, we might just find some exercise that are just so effective. And then they would just immediately cure or, you know, certain illnesses and just like that. That's that brilliant. Would be amazing, isn't it? Uh, I look forward to that. And and I, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about this after the interview. Um, sure. But so then another question, one of our one of our big questions that we, we want to make sure that we ask everybody is um, going forward, let's say broadly in the in the um, Yangshan community, let's say Yangshan community outside of East Asia. Where do you see the trajectory of this going? And, and uh, you know, do you think that there's a, a direction that can be taken that would facilitate more people gaining benefit from these kind of practices or this kind of research? And, and how do you see it potentially unfolding? Mm, I think that's quite an interesting question. I mean, it's, I don't feel like, um, <laughs> I don't know the answer. But then I feel like what you what you're doing is actually almost like steering it into a particular direction, and uh, to kind of bring people in, and um, to yeah to sort of discuss different topics related to Yangshan or related to Chinese medicine or martial arts or those kind of sort of relevant um, uh, practices, which is great, and uh, I think. Um, we don't really know where it goes until we kind of have people gathering, doing more or less the same thing, have a similar aims and ideas. My my aim or what I really would like to see is to really have more of these kind of non-drug-based therapy, which was emphasized in the Sui, in during the Sui period within the medical reforms is to really raise this non-drug based therapy, the dying exercise, to be the sort of the center of the state medicine, I think is so incredible, so incredible. And so imagine if we have a society where, you know, if, if you're ill, you just start with practicing exercise, you know, changing your diet, go through, go for all these non-drug based um, treatments. Then if you're really, really not working, yeah, take take drugs or surgery or whatever. I would say put those things fir first, you know, those dying exercises as the forefront rather than as the sort of peripheral complementary. Do you know what I mean? And that's exactly what Suyandi, the second Sui Emperor, were doing. So no, we're going to put that right in the middle of it. That's going to be the core of our state medicine. Wouldn't that be cool if we, you know, so that I think that is which I would say it will be it will be so incredible and will completely revolutionize our medical services in the modern time. That's a wonderful perspective. I I, I really <laughs> like that. So, so and, yeah. So if if that would be my trajectory of the future, but then whether uh, I'll, whether people will follow me, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's the first time that I've heard it articulated so clearly. So so thank you for that. Maybe <laughs> maybe you've started the ball rolling. Hopefully. <laughs> That'd be great. Well, the um, book the book that's been published is the one that just kind of a bit like throwing the the Chinese would say 
抛砖引引玉。So you throw the a brick. You're trying to attract the jays to come along to say, "Oh yeah, this is a good idea." So yeah, this book is basically to tell people, "Look, we got these、um, you know dying exercises. They are from they are medieval periods, and they're already telling us you know the doctors then were telling us, 'Oh, do these exercises cure these diseases? Well, let's practice and see if it works. If it really works, okay. Well, we can tell the patients practice these. If you got Alzheimer or Parkinson's or You know these kind of、um, ex. You know these kind of conditions. Maybe you can do some exercises as part of your, you know, treatment regime. That would be that would be really amazing. It would be brilliant. And one of the things,、um, just as a quick aside, that I was always so impressed by when I when I lived in Shanghai, I didn't understand it for the first couple of years. But I would see these elderly people, kind of. Like I remember this one man for three years because I used to live near a track, and the first、okay. year he had a walker and he was walking in a very labored and slow way. And in the second year he didn't have the walker and he was limping, and then in the third year he was limping but he was running. And、wow. finally, and finally, I asked somebody, you know, what he what he's doing, and they said, oh, he had a stroke,、oh. and so and so he's training himself to 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 become mobile again. That's real、mm-hmm. determination, and it really inspired me. Wonderful,、really、in the context、wonderful. of Yangsheng, yeah. So what、yes. you're saying, I think, is is more possible maybe than think than people think. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, so now the the very last question. Okay. Is where do we find you,、uh, and where do we find the media that you've made in in your book? If if we should like to、um, further engage with your work. Right. So yes, I do have a personal website, and that is dollyyang dot com. And、um, so the book that just been published by Purple Cloud Institute is available to 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 order. So you're you know you are welcome to、um, order a、uh, order a copy. And、um, so if you're listening this far, <laughs> then I think I will be able to give you a ten percent discount if you want to buy this book. And the discount code, I'm sure your hand,、um, the publisher wouldn't want me to say it in public. But I think if you guys listen to this point, I will say、uh, I will let you know. So the code is M U D O. So if you go to the Purple Car Institute, order this book, and then at the checkout there is a, a there's a there's a, a section tells you if if you have a discount code, then you put M U D O, you get ten percent. That is very very generous, and I'm I'm sure Johan. I I'm I'm friends with Johan too, so、okay. I'm sure I'm sure he'll he'll be delighted.、Um, so I want to thank you very much, and please stick around for a minute after I turn off the recording.、Um, I'll just close it out now. So everybody, you have heard it here first. This is uh, exceptional. Uh, Dolly Yang has has from my perspective personally. Okay, because I want to ask nerdy questions, and I I um now I have to think for a few months. So great, and、uh, thank you very much,、uh, Dolly, for for joining me today.、Um, and you, and I'm I'm looking forward also to to、um, having the chance to talk again in the future. Sure, no problem. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, and to the Dawi community,、um, thank you very much for for watching, and see you in the next video.